can hear me? No. No. Okay. Is there a volume button on this? On the way. So the music next door is a new thing. Um, so still working out the adjustments on it. How's that? How's this? Is that better? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Lots of nods. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Charlotte Billick and I'm Chair of the Creative Writing Department at Austin Community College and we're really grateful that all of you have come out tonight. We know you have a lot of literary options on this evening and we're really excited to be hosting um, Manuel and Owen um, along with Malvern. This is such a beautiful bookstore. Um, we're really lucky to have it and they make a lot of choices about the books that they choose to have in the store. So I encourage you to look around. Um, you may not see um, the books that are here in other bookstores. Um, Austin, Community Colleges, Austin Community College offers a lot of creative writing classes. Um, if you have questions about that, please see me afterwards. Um, let's all turn off our cell phones together, please. Um, there are lots of snacks. So please help us um, not waste food and eat those snacks. Um, Melo and Owen's books are on the back table and they'll be for sale. Uh, so thank you for being here. I'm very excited. These are two of my favorite um, public speakers uh, for what they do and how they pull us in as an audience. And um, Manuel is going to introduce Owen. So um, let's have a great time. Thank you. Hi! I was going to do the lame joke where I pretended to read from the dictionary that the Webster's defined genius as, and then remember that I was reading Owen's introduction of me, that I'm a genius and he's not, but then I didn't. But then I just told you the story of how I was God. So I get all the things that I want. <laughs> Uh, so I'm here to introduce Owen Edgerton, which I don't know that he needs that much introduction since for all of the time that I was living here in Austin as an author, Owen would win the Best of Austin Chronicle Favorite Author Prize, and I would never win it. So it seems like everybody knows who Owen Edgerton is. Um, but I do want to say two stories that kind of uh, epitomize uh, the relationship I have with Owen, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, shortly after we moved back to Austin, my family and I, and shortly after I was offered the job uh, to uh, work with Austin Back Cave, as a celebration we took uh, the family to Deep Eddy, <clears throat> where we were swimming in the pool, and Owen happened to be there with his kids, and we had just met fairly recently. And I went up to him and I was like, hey, hey Owen, nice to see you here at Deep Eddy. And he was like, been well? I was like, yeah. This is the first time I've ever seen you without a shirt, is what he told me. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> so I think it's the only time he's ever seen me without a shirt, but it was weirdly the strangest thing that anybody has told me out of the blue. He didn't say hi. He didn't like say, how's it going? Lovely day to be cool. He said, Manuel, I think this is the first time I've seen you without a shirt. Um, and then the other story, uh, I don't know if you guys know about um, Anish Kapoor. He was the designer of The Bean in Chicago. Uh, he also uh, designed and trademarked a color called the blackest black, which is apparently so black that light cannot pass through it. Uh, but he trademarked it, and this made the artist Stuart Semple very upset because he was like, that's bullshit, you can't trademark a color. And so uh, then Stuart Semple made the pinkest pink, the bluest blue, and the blackest black of his own. And they were free for anybody, but you had to sign a contract that said that under no circumstance would you give the color to uh, Amish Kapoor. Uh, and that's basically how I feel about Owen. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, please welcome Owen Edgerton, author, novelist, short story writer, film director, up and coming favorite film maker in Austin, according to the Chronicle, but what does that rag know? Uh, and all around, 
all around okay guy. <laughs> of me start to insult journalism in, in America. It's gone too far. And, and fashion designers. Hi guys, uh, I'm so glad to see, you. I see many of you guys out here tonight. Isn't it a beautiful night in Austin, Texas? Uh, this happens to be one of my favorite bookstores. Uh, not just in Austin, actually, like, like in the world. It's the type of place, like it is, it has what a lot of bookstores lack, which is the, the, the browsing discovery. You know, you can just go in here and you're gonna find a book that you didn't know existed. And you're just gonna smell it out. And, and then you're going to buy it. Uh, so I hope you guys do that tonight. There are some really beautiful books that Barnes & Noble will never have and Amazon will never suggest. So, uh, so the buy them here and take them home and, and hold them close to your chest. In that I'm not referring to Manuel's books, uh, which are, are, are sort of pop literature and can be found anywhere, um, that kind of stuff. Um, Okay, so um, I, do, uh, I do have a book out, uh, Hollow, uh, and I was going to read to you a little bit from it. I'm not going to read too long, because uh, Manuel tends to go on and on and on when he reads, and we've got places to be. Um, but uh, this, book, this book actually takes place here in Austin, um, and so there's, a, there's quite a bit of Austin in there. Um, I was actually reached, talking to someone, and they were asking about uh, some of the things that, that take place in this book, and, and where, you know, when, did you do all this research and, and stuff like that? And I do do a lot of research because I, I got well into the idea of hollow earth, the theory that the, the earth is hollow and perhaps inhabited, which is, it's like flat earth, but more rounded. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this is, this is a theory that some people hold to be true. And if you look up hollow earth uh, on, online, you'll, you'll find a lot of people uh, and interesting small communities. In fact, when I first did this book release, I put people, um, I'm pretty sure some people from the Hollow Earth came, uh, not from the Hollow Earth, <laughs> <laughs> Hollow Earth enthusiasts came, and I think they were really disappointed. Uh, in the book, they're like, this guy is not a true believer. Um, but also, I, there's just a lot of Austin, and when I was talking to this person about family and Austin and pain and life, and they said, what, what, you know, your research, and I said, you know, I, I tend to write about um, the stuff that has bruised my soul. Uh, oh, usually over the last decade. That, that's sort of what influences a book. Uh, and it just turns out that Austin has kind of, in a pretty beautiful way, bruised my soul. Uh, and um, and it, that, so it turns out that's often what I write about. Um, this part right here, though, is, uh, is about, uh, about, child, about having a child. The moment Miles was born, I was struck by the fact that, of my own mortality his new body wriggling pink on Carrie's chest, and I knew with an odd joy that he was here to eventually take my place on this planet. His birth clearly communicated my death. It was part of the miracle of the moment. I understand billions of babies have been born. I understand there is little as biologically mundane as birth, but can't the mundane be miraculous? We brought a baby home, so small and real. I spent hours staring at his mewling mouth and the soft white fur that covered his pink skin, and the red hairs on his oval head, his face moving through expressions, his limbs twitching out from his body. Our house seemed different with him in it. Not just the toys and the music boxes and onesies, it was the new scents and sounds and life. It was now home to a baby, home to a family. One morning, Miles woke with a cry just before dawn. I cradled him, small, warm body, less than a month in the world, I sang him Muppet songs while pouring myself a cup of coffee. On our back porch, his cries cooed away. I sat on our wooden rocking chair, and he lay in the crook of my arm, and his eyes moving through all kinds of mixed focus on trees and clouds in my face. It was autumn, and the sharp air carried a soft humming. It is easy to believe in the holy of dawn. I didn't say words or address God, but I knew sitting with Miles, watching him opening and closing his eyes, and hands in the new autumn air, that this was somehow prayer. The two oaks in the yard, the changing morning sky, the slight white steam from my cup. The world was enchanted. The soft hum touched it all. Nothing needed to be evidence of anything. All was all, and that was good. Um, in the story, it goes on uh, that this child dies, and uh, and Oliver, who's uh, our narrator, um, is actually accused of, of, of um, 
playing a role in the death of his toddler child. And this uh, makes our character spiral out. Um, uh, he becomes a, um, a frequenter of the homeless shelter where he used to be a volunteer. He, he loses uh, the small faith that he had, he loses his wife, and he only finds community in a community of, of hollow earth enthusiasts. Uh, and, uh, and he begins to go to uh, dark places, which I think is probably the best way to get to see light. Uh, but you have to go through the dark. Um, so this here is a, a section uh, that you might recognize it if, if you go to 6th Street, um, especially uh, the late, later hours. Uh, because that, if you want to get to hell, 6th uh, Street, <laughs> around 2, 2 a.m., 2.05, right? That's, that's about as close as we get. Um, so I'll just read this part here. I circle back to the bars on six. A circle, a swirl. Soon the bars are brighter than the dying sky. Soon those who didn't win the arch bed lottery are building makeshift camps on the sidewalk and disappearing under the highway or down into the scrub by the shallow city creeks. And I know their faces, people I eat with, people I sit with, but I don't eat and I don't stop. And I find myself circling again, looking for Lyle. That's his friend. The crowd grows and they circle Sixth Street too, walking east on the south side sidewalk and west on the north side. Barkers and vendors yell out, barking but not at me. I have nothing to buy with and they know it. They bark at the girls and the boys and the solo sick men offering shots and music and live comedy and cheaper drinks and louder music and possibility. Light. Now the street is late night screams and laughter. And I'm caught again in the swirl, and I'm circling and spinning and screaming for Lyle. I'm catching faces and scanning crowds, I'm spinning, and I need Lyle who will stop me. I step fast, each pedicab driver hoping it's him, some shirtless, one pantless, men and women, each with calves like stone and faces, long-suffering, calling jokes to each other as they pass. Lyle! They spin past me, some with Christmas lights and portable stereos, some with Rasputin beers and long-distant cackles. It is the same path again and again, the same circle, only deeper and tighter each time, burrowing down, narrowing as I descend from the top of the tornado down to the point where the wind hits stone. Job called it God. Job cowered before the winds and he heard poetry. Onto the street where people swerve and bounce against one another. The police have blocked the road from car traffic to allow the drunk and the will be drunk to hop and lope and fall and laugh and the broken heel hits the grate and the cut chin and Lyle. And vendors call out order numbers from the safe boxes, handing out food as the paid drunks and the skirt fucks who reach out and grab their food swirl by, like a child reaching from a merry-go-round only faster. And they manage to grasp beer and tequila and tacos and pizza, and the cover bands play of the teenagers rub and everything that should be glory and laughter is sick and doggish. And it's growing more hellish as 2 a.m. approaches. And the cops and the shitting horses know this. And they stare down at the swirl, waiting and knowing that they'll have to step in. And chances are that the horses will drown and be stripped of flesh and cooked on small fires under the embankments and between grease dumpsters. And perhaps the smell of cooking horse will rise and offend the senses of the condo owners above. Some are trying to sleep in the swirl, curled figures in door doorways, pushed against steps, Heads covered, hands clinging, even in sleep, clinging to plastic bags of belongings, an extra shirt, perhaps an ID, a pay-as-you-go cell phone. And those spinning and dancing, but they're clinging too, even as they spin, and they're clinging to bodies and cash and highs, and they're clinging and trotting and shredding all in the same waters, all in the same spinning waters. And we're all going down, and it makes very little difference the shape of the scrap wood that you cling to. A family of four in yellow sweaters stands on the corner singing hymns and handing out tracks and the madness is as drunk and sad as those passing. And the girl's skirt is ripped and she doesn't know it. And the man hoots anger, locking eyes with anyone, hooting, daring them, wanting a fist like it's food. And they spin and the street spins. And there are ghosts too, howling and screaming and bleeding spirit up and down the road, but no one can hear over the cover bands or the wailing plump girl who spills her purse or the fire truck sirens half a mile away. Lyle! The back of the pedicab catches my ribs and knocks me down. Fucking drunk, the girl passenger says. Even as she passes, I can smell her perfume like burning fields of roses. And the music plays from every door and roof and mixes like grease smoke in the streets. And people cough from the sound and I circle again. 
Further in, faces pale and pool bald eyed stare up from the storm drains, watching as we circle, not yet risking to grab at us, but waiting, waiting. I should wash this all with gasoline and lye, clean my hands with a burn. It's 2 a.m., and the bars who have loved them and protected them have pushed them through the doors with orders to fly, but some can no longer walk. A couple, maybe 18, can't stand from the curb and the taxi they call won't find them. And they'll be there three with their heads exploding and the street cleaners will sweep up their brains but leave their corpses for the bulk of trash pickup. They're all still circling, brain sick and staggering. These were my students. These were my children. I go to one boy, be careful, be careful. They'll grab you from the gutters. He pushes me and laughs. I go to one girl, her dress like sausage casing pulled over her body. Be careful. And she yelps and clings to her tall friend and both stumble on their heads and scamper away with tiny steps. I'm circling the center now, spiraling to a point of no motion. The whirlpool takes me in. I think I'm crying. Someone is crying. The whirlpool is closing now. I can see that. All eyes eventually close, even the eyes of storms. Uh, thank you, guys.